So we are going to talk about vegetables today. Hopefully, at the end of the afternoon, you would want to eat more vegetables. <laughs> we'll talk about consumption trends first, based on secondary data. This is uh, what our imports and exports look like from 1999 to 2005. Most of these spikes in exports are garlic and onions. <coughs> In imports, I mean. And this is the remorse data from the year 2000 to the year 2009. Um, the yellow line is the total supply. The green line is the production, total country. And uh, these are for both tropical and temperate vegetables. But it's not all because the information doesn't have uh, anything on the system, the uh, salads. The blue line are our importations. Now these are garlic and onions. Our exports are composed mostly of uh, asparagus. So we are a, uh, I mean, it's supposed to be an increase in supply, right? But if we look at demand, this is relatively, uh, you know, that's 50 plus per capita per year. And by, the, by 2003, which is the latest data we can get from FNRI at the moment, it's 40 kilograms per person per year. When we compare that to other countries like Vietnam, for example, they consume 110 kilos per person per year. But we, Filipinos, we only consume 40 kilos. And FNRI, Food Nutrition Research Institute, is saying each person to be healthy must eat at least 100 kilos. So we owe our bodies 60 kilos every year, because we're only eating 14. So this is a very flat demand for vegetables. From 1990 to the year 2004, it's just uh, at that particular point. And this, most of the increase is only brought about by population, because our demand per capita is, is uh, flat. So basically, that's the demand when we look, we look at the ultimate consumer the ones in the household. It's a low demand and it's relatively flat. So what's the, what's the thing that uh, pushes us to try and work with vegetables as an institution? And I'm referring to UP Mindanao as an institution because we're working on the research on vegetables funded by Asia. Let's look at retail trends first. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for these are information from Planet Retail, and I'm sorry I cannot get information from 2007 onwards because we um, couldn't get any more subscriptions for Planet Retail. If you look at the growth of retail sales in the Philippines, it's 14%. <coughs> the growth of modern grocery distribution, talking about food and non-food items that are usually in supermarkets, it's 10%. And if you look at in millions of dollars, it's uh, just the grocery sales. I mean, it's 11 percent growth from 2004 to 2005, and 22 from 2005 to 2006. So we can see from this kind of information, there's no vegetable share here, and it cannot be really deciphered. But there is a lot of movement in retail that is moving away from wet market distribution to the more um, grocery type supermarket distribution. So there is an increase in the role of supermarkets in our retail lives. And many housewives are now choosing to shop at supermarkets rather than the wet market. Okay, here, this is the SM group. They have 11.9% share of the market. And you have total 34.5%. This is telling us that supermarkets really are going to be a, play a bigger role in our life. No? In other countries, it's, uh, supermarket has replaced the wet market in many of retail. It's only in the Philippines where uh, we still have a lot of wet market action and other Asian, ASEAN countries. Okay, so increased purchases from supermarkets rather than wet markets is likely. So we went, we went into this study with the uh, Asia funded project under regard. We wanted to identify the different institutional market segments for vegetables in southern Philippines. But uh, 
the study expanded to looking at the demand for entire Philippines, including Metro Manila. We wanted to determine the characteristics and the needs of these particular market segments. Is there a market segment or are they all the same? Are they they're just all vegetables? And then what about the smallholder farmers? The situation is if the supermarkets are the one that's going to distribute vegetables, how will the small farmer enter the distribution chain of supermarkets? When in fact supermarkets require official receipts, they require sophisticated delivery systems, they require HACCP and GAP. So how about the small farmer? It will not, not have a share in the market. So that's why this thing is important to consider. Information was taken from key informal interviews. This is a qualitative study. It's not quantitative, it's qualitative. So we talked to experts in the industry. We talked to the fast food industry players and we talked to executive chefs. The executive chefs are mostly located in Manila. They are an influencer group. They, 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 they make the menu and then they, they inform the hotel chains what sort of menu they should be having. Food service operators, all kinds of restaurants, whether fast food or not, wholesalers and consolidators and the retailers. So we talked to anyone who was willing to talk to us. And then we went to every major urban center in Metro Manila, Visayas, and Mindanao. So Metro Manila, we went to Cebu, we went to Bacolod, Tagbilaran, Dumaguete, Iloilo, Tacloban, or Mokdabao, Cagayan de Oro, and General Santos. Okay. Now this is a map that we drew up in 2004. And uh, you can see that there is this colored yellow boxes this one, the vegetable processors, supermarkets, fast food chains, hotels, and restaurants. They more or less belong to what we would call the like a more dynamic. So usually they're just called the modern chain. They are modern chains because there are certain requirements that they need from their suppliers. It's not like a wet market scenario where you can bring in the soil and all the ogat and all the remaining leaves. These kinds of buyers are more sophisticated. They have a specific uh, quality requirement. These others, these are part of what we would call the traditional market. Meaning you have your farmer, and then this is what you, they would call the viajero, the viajador, um, tapos you have wholesalers from the urban wet markets, and then the retailers. So this one is the traditional chain. This has been the kind of structure that has been existing in this country since the 60s, where you have a buyer who would go to the vegetable farm and they will tell the farmer, I will finance you, you sell me your produce. So the farmer plants given financing by the traders and consolidators, and they are then, um, of course, they have to sell their produce to the wholesaler or consolidator that gave them the money, right? That's why, because it's financing. Okay? So, the farmers sometimes feel that they are uh, at the losing end if, if they go into this kind of relationship because the marketing system and the financial structure are not in. Whoever finances gets the produce, which is, of course, just, uh, it's just right from a business perspective, but for farmers, they feel that they, they do not maximize their revenues because of these kinds of relationships. So we look in possible ways by which we can study this particular chart and see if there's anything more to it that we can sort of piece out. And so we go, we go for market segmentation, which is a way of dividing a very heterogeneous market into sections so that, that the section will have similar characteristics, more homogeneous characteristics. So when we talk about people who are in this room, you can be divided into male and female, that's one demographic variable, or by age, if you want, or length of hair. These are characteristics that are physical that we can see, and then we can say, oh, well, we have several kinds of people. We have people wearing red and pink, and then people wearing white, people wearing yellows. These are segments in terms of clothing. Are there segments in the institutional markets for vegetables? If we look at the consumer market, 
we can see that we have urban centers and rural areas. People live in rural areas and urban centers. We have a dense population in urban areas. But in each of these areas, we have a portion of the household or the consumer market which we call upper income. That is one market segment. But in between these two areas, we have an institutional market. <coughs> these are people whose demand, these are institutions whose demand is derived from the consumer market or the household market. So institutional market is a direct demand. Obviously, the buyer of the institutional market will eventually end up to be the ultimate consumer. So the buyer's buyer, somehow it's going to be the ultimate consumer. So we need to know where they are, and then we can understand what is happening to this one. Who are they serving? Who is the customer's customer, in other words? No? So when you look at that, Based on data from country stat, no, 2010, they have information there that talks about consumption of vegetables. The AB, which is the upper income market segment, earning approximately 50,000 pesos a month, uh, living in very nice houses with complete amenities, they would have the highest consumption of, veg of all kinds of vegetables, I mean, practically all, including the salads, all the chop suey type, and all the pak bet type of vegetables, or what you call in result, pinak bet type of vegetables. The CND middle income group, the lower income group, they have high consumption of vegetables in the following, sitaw, talong, ampalaya, talosan kamote, ketchup. Meaning, when, when you talk about these particular commodities, it is the C and D which consume higher than the AB. But you talk about everything else, the AB has high, higher consumption than all of them. E, which is, uh, the E is classified as about 8,000 pesos a month uh, income, family income, 8,000 pesos a month. They have the lowest per capita consumption of all kinds of vegetables. Now, if you look at statistics, in Mindanao, for example, 54% of our population in the now is E, earning 8,000 pesos a month. And does that mean that they have less consumption of vegetables? Right? That really, really doesn't compete in my mind, right? Because most of the people in the rural area would have their own vegetable patch, wouldn't they? But these are information that talks about purchase. It doesn't talk about what you grow in your backyard. Okay, now. We have to look at institutional markets. The first thing we have to do is find out what are the typologies, what are the characteristics across the different people that we talk to that can be classified into certain variables we call, or segmentation variables. And these are the five that we saw. Of course, it was useless to classify them according to age, or even size of institution, because the size of institution tells us only about volume. It's not going to talk about um, specifications. So the role in the chain, what are they? Are they the end user? Do they process? Do they buy and sell again? Do they buy, process, and sell? Do they plant? What, what do they do in the chain, in the vegetable chain? Where are they in terms of location? Um, we notice that each city has a different characteristic. For example, when we looked at the entire country, it is Bacolod that was very um, interested in organic anything. Bacola. So Bacola was very big on organic. They had their own certi local certification system. It was the, the, the municipal agricultural officer that certified um, the vegetables that they were okay. And they used the word organic in their shops, even without any field cert or OCCP certification. They just say organic. And then you ask them, how do you know it's organic? I mean, the municipal agriculture officer says it's organic and so it's okay. Even the, the market is okay with that, and so it's fine. It's fine. So, Bacola. Ilo Ilo is very loyal to Baguio vegetables. Very loyal. Because Baguio vegetables get to Ilo Ilo in several ways. But when you ask the Ilo Ilo people what are their preferences in terms of cabbage, carrots, everything else, they all describe the Baguio vegetables. So uh, it's the route, no? it's very close. And then Cebu is a transshipment point of everything. And you would think nothing grew in Cebu because they had no water. But because almost uh, all of the businessmen are there, and if you ask them, that's the main reason. So they buy vegetables from Bukidnon, they buy from Kabantian, 
or more, they buy from Canlaon, they pack, they pack, and then they sell to Mohol. They sell to Nebros, they sell to Tacloban. Imagine it goes through or more, and then they repack and then it goes back to Tacloban. So each island and each each city has a different characteristic. But there's one thing that you can tell from the way old sailors and retailers talk in the Visayan Islands. They do not like vegetables that have crossed the seas. So when you talk about eggplant, tropical vegetables, eggplant, ampalaya, you know those things that are in the pinakbet category, <clears throat> they would rather buy it locally, source it internally. So when we want to look at inter-island movement, what is interesting to look at would be the semi-temperate vegetables, the cabbages, the carrots, the potatoes, and the, the salads, the lettuce, the romaine, the dolorosa, and all those things. Because they do not grow everywhere. It is only the, the places that are cool that can grow carrots and cabbages and, uh, and uh, lettuces, which is an opportunity for seed producers. Because if seed producers can come up with some kind of seedling of these temperate vegetables that grow in the lowland, you can actually look at every island and have them all planting lowland cabbages, lowland carrots, and lowland potatoes. Okay, the first segment that we thought we saw is the yellow one, composed of very upscale hotels, and I'm talking about hotels that cost 16,000 pesos a night. Like Shangri-La, you know, this guy, it's very expensive times. Hotels, resorts, restaurants, and some upscale supermarkets. Who is the market? So we said we wanted to know the buyer's buyer. The, the market of this uh, are the foreign tourists, because they can afford. In Cebu, they're mostly Korean and upper income consumers. Maybe coming from Metro Manila, because the majority of the upper income in this country resides in Metro Manila, 23%. Of the, of the people in Metro Manila are upper income, co co as compared to 0.2% of Mindanao. So this is what one hotel looks like. This is how plush they are. Uh, that's white sand. That's not cemento. Puting buhangin yan. At saka ganyan ang itsuro na swimming pool nila. Super social to the max. And then, so we call it the plush market. Leisure, leisure, and work in an upscale style. So it's just a name that came up with. If you have another suggestion for the name, we can, we'd like to think of consider that. What are their needs? Ang gusto nilang gulay. Lahat. The widest range of salad, vegetables, chop suey type, pinapet, tropical. Because when they serve a buffet, they will give exotic vegetables. Pala okra, maliliit na ang palaya, mga exotic. Ito kasi may pagong doon. They have uh, shared paste there. So they also have this broccoli and cauliflower and all these different uh, semi-temperate vegetables. And of course, they need a lot of potatoes. They have also a need for specialty carrots, which they cannot yet get, except from one producer in Cavite. Baby carrots, uh, some special kinds of mushrooms, portabella, shiitake, and all these different kinds of leeks. All, they, have, they want different kinds of leeks and um, I wasn't aware that there were different kinds of leeks. But they also want all the different leaves available for their stala. So all the different colors of lettuces, not just iceberg, not just romaine, but all the different kinds. And when they buy vegetables, whoever is supplying them, they want the vegetables washed, while lupa, trimmed, wala na, basta hihiwain na lang nila. And if you are supplying them, you have to leave everything Behind, you have to bring it with you and throw it. It's not their responsibility to throw it. Because they say they're um, sticking to some HACCP rules. But they're not asking about the chemical content of the vegetables that are supplied to them. Now they want, some of them that we talked to, <clears throat> want onion, garlic, and ginger to be peeled, even the onion. So no more brown part, just the white thing. That means that they want to be able to, they need to be able to use all of that in one day. Ginger also peeled. So that's a pleasure market. And then they are the most quality discerning. We're spending a bit of time here because in the segment one, because they are like they're set apart from everyone else. They have formal product descriptions, they have their particular size. 
But we cannot give you a generalized size for all of them because each hotel wants a specific size. And then one, one upscale supermarket wants another size. So you can say this is the size that they want. It's dependent on each buyer group. And then they want their suppliers to have a food safety program. So if they're HACCP certified, you must also be HACCP certified. The farmers have to be GAP certified. Some require that sources practice sustainable agriculture because they have social accountability in their in their promises, part of the things that they, they signed up to. And then they price they fix prices weekly. Most of them actually fix prices weekly. And they allow prices to be changed uh, twice a week. They, you can call and tell them there's something that went wrong with our cabbages and uh, the supply has to come from this area if you're a supplier and, and they will agree to that. But it's a fixed date for many of them. Like, some would say every Tuesday and Thursday you can change the price. The others say we fix price Mondays and that's it for the entire week. So the relationship that you build into supplying the upscale plush market would be important because it's when you sum up all the volume, uh, it's a very big volume. This accounts for 5% of total Metro Manila, Metro Cebu market. So for Metro Manila, it's 586,500 individuals. Or when you translate it into consumption, 451 tons of vegetables. The very high quality. For Metro Cebu, that's uh, 40,800 or 30 tons of vegetables. Why is it just Metro Manila, Metro Cebu? They are the only two cities in this country that have a high upper income uh, population. All the rest are low. Yeah, well, less than 23%. 10 maybe, like that. They are the market segment that understands the concept of organic and safe vegetables. So when you talk to them about organic vegetables, they know what it means. In many of the other cities, uh, it was a very interesting thing because we asked them, some of the households that we talked to, we asked them, uh, do you, do you uh, buy or eat organic vegetables? They say yes. And then, uh, what organic vegetables do you buy or eat? Hello, Bati. Tapos na kamote. O nga naman, di ba? Hindi naman naman nai-spray ko. So, tama naman sila. What are the implications of this organic awareness of the upper income market? The producers, our farmers, the, whoever can do so, must move towards the production of safe, low-chem, and or organic vegetables. Now, if you ask me about organic five years ago, I would have told you five years ago, hindi tayo, natikyo lang, sorry, honey. But now it's different. Um, when we gave a talk to FAO yeah, five years ago, I told them maybe in three years' time, do you know organic is already one of the things that many of our consumers and about households would be interested in? But that would be the upper income households, the ones that are more educated, the ones that have a higher disposable income, and the ones that are more exposed to other countries' requirements. But the the, even the non-upper income, middle and lower, they know about organic, but they won't really uh, pay anything more uh, for organic because they'll just get it from their backyard. So they will pay, the upper income is willing to pay 10% more. Hotels will say, if it's certified organic, we'll pay 10% more. So we have two types of certification so far in the Philippines, FinSearch, which is uh, uh, an independent body headed by Hilka Randang, they're probably coming to base and OCCP, Organic Certification Council of the Philippines. Mga mahal na certification. So producers must be able to grow all kinds of vegetables throughout the year because the demand is constant throughout the year, right? And it's also, when you have all of these tourist people, they come in uh, in the year because our temperature is almost constant. We will, they will need some kind of rain shelter. For Mindanao, it's just rain shelter, which is known as typhoons. But in other countries, other parts of the Philippines, it has to be against the wind, strong enough to to uh, withstand the wind as well, so that the vegetables can be, be grown all the year round. If you go to Benguet now, uh, the, the market crop is puro na protected crop in doon, puro na protected lahat doon. Okay, so for Mindanao, it's an advantage for us because we don't have typhoons and we can grow vegetables throughout the year. We have the opportunity to supply uh, Luzon, by the way. No? And I think we have, uh, as of the moment, we supply the tomatoes of Metro Manila from July to November as much as 45% coming from the Pignon area for Mindanao. 
So the second segment, we call it segment two, or the business and budget segment. This is composed of business hotels, not anymore the luxurious hotel, main price resorts, and some supermarket chains. No? So the upper income and middle income consumers are also the market for that, budget tourists, and what we call the mice, the convention market. Meetings, okay? um, conventions, exposition, and So this is one of the many brands that are now visible in a supermarket chain, Nature's Best. Um, okay, and this is something that is in a middle class supermarket and it's San Benito Wellness. It runs 100% organic vegetables certified by Pilsert. I Pilsert a lot. Free from harm, harmful pesticides, free from harmful herbicides, and free from harmful fertilizers. So this is zucchini, squash, Ay, sukin pala yun. Ano kaya to? Hindi ko makilala. Kampalaya. At saka, baggy beans. Baggy beans yung nasa dun. Ay, sukini pa rin yan. Yan yung isang sukini kinunan ko, pinagpatok yung dalawa para. Bawal ako kasi magkuha ng pictures sa supermarket. Huwag ko ako isusumbong, ha? Hindi ko nga sinasabi kung saan supermarket ako nagkukuha ng picture. Kaya kung may alihin ng supermarket, nakita nyo ako nagkukuha ng picture, huwag nyo na lang akong huliin. Ito po ay, this is also, a, I'm sure you've seen it kasi this is in Metro Manila. Uh, they put low, uh, labels of the vegetables and they put the nutritional um, to increase the purchase of vegetables. What's happened in supermarkets, uh, especially in Metro Manila, it has become the attractant of buyers. So, they put the vegetables very early in the display or very behind so that you have to walk all the way from the entrance to the back just to look at the vegetables, just to buy isang supot ng luya, gano'n. And makikita mo na lahat ng mga sale ng shampoo at saka ng mga ano, mapapabili ka na, di ba? So, it is now an attractive part of supermarkets. Um, in 2000, I... I saw an increase and measured, physically measured an increase of 20% floor space in supermarkets because uh, floor space attributed or given to vegetables. So increase of 20% in the floor space, that is a big deal for supermarkets because supermarkets rent by the square foot. Diba? Doon sila kumikita eh, real estate ng supermarket. So in the business and budget market, you, they are more price conscious. Everything is about price. That's why they would buy from anyone. Basta mura. Sometimes the relationship is sacrificed because they're always after price. They practice flexibility of the products they offer. If you don't have broccoli and they don't have the supply of broccoli and you ask for something, but with broccoli on the menu, they say, wala eh, iba na lang, mam at not available. Diba? That's what they always say. They don't make you know a big deal out of um, the unavailability of a particular vegetable. And then, uh, some have salad vegetables, but not all. Most, probably most of the time, they would have tropical vegetables, the pinak bed or the pak bed type, and the chak suey vegetables, the semi tempered type only. Okay, now you saw this drawing earlier. If we were to summarize segment one and segment two, this is segment one and this is segment two. So, segment one is a portion of this upscale market of supermarkets in yellow here, which is what we call a plush market, very discerning, very demanding. And then we have this business and budget market, the vegetable processors especially. Okay? Are you okay? Do you understand? Good. Okay, there's four. We have four segments, we have three and four. Uh, wholesalers and consolidators, they market this one scale, if you remember, this is segment one, okay? Business market, this is segment two. This one is segment four. Who is in the middle? These guys. These wholesalers and consolidators control a very large portion of the vegetable industry. They are also the hardest to interview. They're the most difficult to get information from. 
And we call them the traditional middle. <laughs> sila, very sila lahat bada, not saying that. I'm just saying that they they are the ones that really are the experts of, um, they are the market in Timor Jaris that are the experts in the industry. Okay, just a few pictures. These are um, tomatoes from Libona, that's in the Cagayan area. These are broccoli from Cagayan, Bukidnon, and cauliflower from Bukidnon. They're going to be shipped to Bohol. This is the truck that it goes in. Did you see how nice the vegetables were? Then they go into this kind of truck. This is the operation of the traditional middle, the trend mid. And there's this man that is sitting on the vegetables. Can you see him? Yes. There you go. These are vegetables. These are not, it's not garbage. This is calabasa and you know, they, they put the hard vegetables at the bottom as if it doesn't get bruised. And the leafy ones on top. And this is sit on it anyway. And we have the, the same truck. We follow the trucks repetitiously and took pictures. And these are the leafies. They threw down the sack, the, the sacks to these pallets. May kaleta dyan sa ilalim. Hindi yan gently put down. They were kept into the pallet. And look at this position. Nakasi sinipala. pala. And when it gets down, ayan pa. You see this fire? Alam niyo ba ang dahon niya? Mumbok. Chinese pechay. Or Chinese garbage. Usually, I'm going to weigh one more. Well, even I'm going to weigh kimchi. <laughs> okay, so the truck from the market is this truck. They would unload it and then to a pallet like this. May mga pangalan na yan. Yan yung pangalan ng kaente at yung mga wholesaler. Ah, itilipat sa isang pang truck. Oh, di ba? Hindi ba doon wala hindi yung tabag dyan? This, because this is um, sa pier. This one is sa pier. Yung isang truck is sa palengke, sa agora. Hindi pwedeng yung truck na yung palengke ang pupunta dun sa barko. Kailangan ito kasi hindi siya authorized. Ha, di ba? So, nakapalengka siya, patong-patong, ang ganda, no? And then, punta siya ng barko. Papunta siya ng, hindi siya mabunta ng hoko, ha? Papunta siya ng bohol. Papunta siya ng bohol. Yan. Ngayon, akala ko hindi nila pinapatong ang isang paleta ng gulay. Tapos patungo na isang pang paleta ng gulay. Di ba? Hindi. Pinatong mo. Sa loob ng boat, magkapatong yung paleta. Pero yung isang sako, nakaganyan ha. E prekaryo yung pagkakalagay. Pero ito nga yun. E di okay yung isa siya. Kaya pagdating doon, yung nga, ang mga second na 30%. You know where this is. Gladly the trading post. As far as you can see, they are all trading vegetables. Okay, in Latin and that trading post, have a different way of making relationships. These guys here, they're also selling their produce. These guys here, they are not the same guys that are here. These guys here sell from truck to bus, or from truck to jeep, or from truck to truck. If you get in here, that means you don't have a committed buyer yet. Okay? So, now here, these are the only cauliflower in that area during that day. No one was buying it. You'd think huh, that they would have a run for the market because their price was too high. And the buyers are waiting for a few hours. Now, this is spot market trading. This is the traditional market. It's the way it's been done for generations in this country. That's why we don't eat gulai, because of the way it's sold. Huh? So anyway, they're waiting for, I know, Shingdang come, and then the buyers will come and have the price down. By the time it's afternoon, they would have sold something. These are the guys that are outside the, the Latin Unidad trading post. They are repacking from point to point. So the people who are repacking, they are the buyers. And they will repack and they will put it into the these 25 kilo plastic bags and then bring them to the Divisoria that looking like this. Carrots and sayote, potatoes and the leafies on top. Usually if it's in a box, they would be the cauliflower, the broccoli and the, the other leafies. There, one on top of the other. So we really have to have very durable vegetables. 
to this kind of post harvest handling. So the trap middle, the trap middle, God, what do they want? They want all kinds of vegetables, everything. Because they sell to segment one, segment two, and segment four. They are the middle, so they buy everything, everything goes to them. And they account for the largest volume of vegetables traded in the wholesale market, of course. Now, the strategy is they use the better quality vegetables to give to segment one, and the not so good ones to give to the other segments. So they have multiple sources, they buy direct from farmers, they buy from other wholesalers, they buy from tomatoes, they buy from Ilocos, Baguio, and Cagayan de Oro. They have the capacity to import if needed. Sometimes when you look at the supermarkets, uh, there are carrots there that I am sure are not our carrots, they are not from this country. They belong to another country and they are being sold in SM. <laughs> okay, these are tomatoes in Iloilo. Ganyan ka dami. By the crates. Now, this is another review. We talked about the yellow boxes a while ago, segment one and segment two. This is now segment three. And then, we're going to talk about segment four in a while. Then. Who do they sell to? To us. Ayo, <laughs> ayo 75 to 80% of retail sales of fresh vegetables are in the wet market, and it is decreasing, not increasing. <coughs> a few lectures, maybe a few years ago, the lecture would go from 85 to 90. But in 2011, it's 75 to 80%. Quality requirements are not very strict because the Filipino consumer, when the Filipino consumer goes to the wet market, you go to this pile of potatoes, di pa namimili tayo? Kamatis. Hindi pinala. Ate, namimili ito. Naamoy, pinukurot, tinutuklaw, di ba? Because we self-select. And we have our own quality requirements. And we buy based on our own quality requirements and our price requirements. So, generally, there is really no shortage of supply, except for onions and garlic. So, if we could please have some kind of seed for onions and garlic that will survive in the Philippines, it will be great. There's a very big demand for onions and garlic. Products that begin to deteriorate are cut and made into ready-to-cook vegetable mixes. Like this. Where is it? Ah, like this. Yeah. So they, during the time that we took this picture, they all sold for the same price, 10 pesos. Whatever city in the Visayas, it was 10 pesos. In Metro Manila, it was 12. In Cebu, it was 12. But anywhere, it's, it's 10 pesos. And there was even one enterprise, this is a global based this person. Meron siyang, ano ba yung tawag dyan? Parang lor, some kind of lor, some kind of seasoning. Na andun yung gulay, ilalagay niya na yung lor doon, tapos sinusupan niya. Nasa palengke yan. Palengke na taklobal. Taklobal kasi doesn't have a very good vegetable industry yet. The mayor, of course, is working on it, no? And they're, they're following the lead of uh, Ormo, which is going into some kind of organic agriculture. Okay? Now, the retail levels, anywhere, they look the same. Diba? You, you, it can be from any city. Look, this one is from Ormo. This one is from Taolo. This one is from Iloilo. Taklobal. Kahit saan, may tulong na ali. Diba? Talaga, may tulong pala yung natin. Ang difference lang, it's very obvious that in cities like Tacloban, um, yeah, I think it's, Tacloban is the worst supply situation. They have very little vegetables to go with, but they also have very little demand. They, they don't really eat too much vegetables. If you look at the consumption ratio for Visayas for vegetables, it's smaller than Luzon and Mindanao. Like Cebu, if you are from Cebu, you know that everything that you eat is sinasawsaw sa suka. And you know, diba? So it's isda, it's suka, there's very little gula. And gula yun, buso, at saka lato. In, okay, now, and we have a few more slides and then we're ending. We, what, what do we do now with this kind of situation? What about our small farmers? 80% of the farmers in the Philippines are poor and they are mostly vegetable farmers. And most farmers plant vegetables because it's supposed to be a cash crop. We encourage our farmers to plant gulay because it only takes three months and then they have money. But to whom do they sell it? Which market? 
What is the implication for them? Siyempre, you are a smallholder group. Uh, you need facilitation. You need assistance. Hindi pwedeng ikaw lang may isip mo to lahat. And they have an educational level of 2 to 3 years. Di ba? Para many of them don't even keep records. They don't, you know, estimate how much chicken dung they put in, how many hours they work. Their costing is non-existent. They don't know their cost. They just say, Lugi ako. How do you know you're lugi? How much did it cost you to produce? Hindi nila alam. Pero ngayon, nag nag iba yung scenario, no? They need to be facilitated. That's why they need a CMG, a collective marketing group. They have to work together. Many small farmers working together will create an impact. They will have enough volume to be able to supply one retailer. They can go to that particular retailer. But they have to have enough supply within them. That means that they have to have standard planting. That means that they have to have production planning. That means that they have to meet every week or every month, and they have to agree as a group. So we call this the class three method. Then also there's a need for market development for specific market niches that can help expand the market for small producers for the products, but it has to be coordinated. There's always a possibility of appealing to the social responsibility of a big retailer, for example, like SM Shop Price Stands to tell them to buy a portion of their produce, vegetables, from smallholder farmers and not require a receipt. They always require a receipt. Diba? There was lots of market in Davao that tried it. And they were not requiring the receipt from this uh, farmer group that was being facilitated. But eventually, the farmer group decided to stay get out of the relationship for what we saw. Because the supermarket chain thinking that because they were not required receipts, wanted the price that was really rock bottom for the farmers. And so the farmers opted out. But um, things have changed since then. That was in 2005, and now it's 2011. The same supermarket has a change of heart. The, so the farmers are now selling directly to them again. Legal identities and documents are required. Kailangan meron sila mga BIR, mga ganoon, and small farmers do not want to organize into cooperatives anymore. They've been burned by the word cooperative. Cooperativa. Parang ayaw na nila yun. Parang pili nila. Pag nag-contribute sila, itatakbo ng leader yung pera. Ganun, no? So, ngayon, mas maganda pagka sila ay tinatawag na cluster. 5 to 15 farmers sa cluster. Tapos, when they're mature enough, they can register as an association sa dole. No? Association, which is cheaper. Uh, hindi kailangan ng seminar and all that. Then the, the farmers need to learn to commit to the market. If they promise the market we will supply you with 200 kilos of cabbage every week, every Thursday, they, they must do so. They must supply. And if they cannot supply because of typhoon, or, they must text the buyer and tell them, Why? Yung bag, yung ahako, nasira lahat ng aming cabbage, hindi kami makakabigay sa iyo ngayon. I'm sure the buyer will understand, di ba? Okay. Ah, acknowledgement. I thank my the funding agency, Cartier, and uh, other partners. That's true. Thank you, Cartier. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Concepcion. We are now open for questions. Please use the microphones around the room to ask your questions. Please introduce yourself as well as your organization. Any questions for Dr. Concepcion? Questions or comments for Dr. Concepcion? I am married. My yes. husband is over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. What is the present uh, post harvest losses for vegetables in general? In general, for leafies, it's 70. <laughs> At the retail end, the 30% is immediately deducted from the share of the farmers. We're talking about the leafy vegetables, no? automatically. So when you deliver 100 kilos, automatically 70 na ang babayaran sa farmer. And then as it goes through the chain, by the time it's at the retail end, they will have the, the shrinkage would have been that 70%, which is too big and it's too inefficient. And this is only for one study. But the others are, are less than that. For example, in one of the later chains that we're trying to facilitate, where the farmer harvests one day, the next day it's in the supermarket. And the supermarket is the one that is repacking it. They have less shrinkage. We haven't uh, 
really calculated out that we intend to do that. So they don't have Reseco, it's called Reseco. We're trying not to get the 30% Reseco from the farmers anymore. Any more questions? Again, please use the microphones around the room and introduce yourself. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bel Chamsu from Diponegoro University, uh, Indonesia. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I want to ask the first about the... Uh, as I know the first time when I come here in Philippines, uh, around June 2009, I really know that uh, the consumption, consumption of the vegetable with the Philippines is very lower. Uh, can I know what is actually, what is the reason about it? And uh, some of the people say that, oh, the price is higher. But actually, I, I didn't feel that bad if I compare with Indonesia. It's nearly the same, but uh, any, I think any, any other reason why they uh, lower uh, consumption of the vegetable. The second, uh, the last, the last uh, conclu conclusion that you make is about the institution institutional uh, small producer to support them uh, including the technique and the soft, soft credit and the other. Is it really until now they did, uh, the Department of Agriculture didn't have that uh, kind of the uh, program to make the uh, community group of the small producer to uh, support them to produce and get the good technique and the other. And the last, it's the question about the. Uh, I make, uh, I try to make one small reason about the fruit, not in vegetable. I'm not yet try it, but in fruit, uh, I try to buy uh, orange from the market. I put it in table. I see until around two weeks. Never spoil. Yes. Uh, is it? Uh, happen to in the vegetables because if we if we see uh, in one day the vegetable cannot sell so it will be spoiled so did you know what did they have they do with this vegetable that cannot sell thank you okay. just one sound make sure the vegetables are crawl out of the table if it does you shouldn't eat it <laughs> <laughs> okay the first question has got to do with why um, consumers in the Philippines eat less vegetables than other ASEAN countries. When we did a study in 2004, uh, we asked the consumers why they do not eat vegetables. Most of the reasons were that I do not like the taste. Well, second, we don't know how to prepare. Too much time to prepare. And third, they don't force me. Imagine the parents do not force the children to eat vegetables. Why? Because the parents do not eat vegetables. <laughs> I mean, you look at the calendaria that we have. How many vegetable dishes are there? One. Adobong sitaw, ba? Adobong kangkong. Tapos na takbet. Takbet lang ang lagi na doon. Tapos wala na. Ano pa ang iba doon? Ginataang isda. Isda na mga dahon sa bahon sa dahon sa sabing. Sinigang na isda. Sinigang na baboy. Pork chop. Chicken barbecue. Pura yan kami lahat. Ang gulay doon, ito. From experience, ha? Kasi kanina kung may isa karindiria dito sa katamba, ang gulay, pakbit. May timpa yung tsura niya, o parang, <laughs> parang malapit. I'm sorry, I was speaking. Pakbit, the only thing that was being sold there that was uh, uh, in vegetable was the pinapit, which was starting to turn black. I think it's necrophilia or something. <laughs> 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 but, of course, it's not <laughs> And the, the why we don't eat vegetables, for the Visayan Islands, I would say that it's because the staple is rice and fish. And the regions that eat vegetables in the Philippines, up to 100 plus kilos per capita, is Ilocos, the Ilocos region, General Santos, Sarangani province, and some parts of Cagayan, Pitnon. They are the provinces that eat most vegetables. Visayas, some parts of Luzon, and some parts of Mindanao, do not, period. <laughs> they don't eat vegetables, their children um, are not being trained to eat vegetables. So if you have kids, I'd like to just encourage you to force yourself to eat vegetables so that your children will eat vegetables as well. We have to be a healthier nation. And the only, we can also help our farmers. Think of all those 
80% of the farm is going hungry because you will not buy their vegetables. There was a time in this Mindanao, they sold their cabbages for 3 pesos a kilo. 3 pesos a kilo. Can you imagine? Because nobody wanted to buy. How sad, di ba? Now, if we ate more cabbages, wouldn't our farmers be richer? Wouldn't they not stop them from going over to the other side and joining the insurgents? Right? You know, if you want peace in vegetables, lalo, no? That's it. Yes. So, okay. Um, that's the first question. The second question was... Spoiling. <laughs> the third one is about the spoilage. What was your second question? Is it because you're not uh, from the... the oh, okay, okay. Behalf. That's right. That's right. The Department of Agriculture assists our farmers. In fact, they even included vegetables as part of the high-value commercial crops. They have. But the thing with the vegetable industry is that the farmers have a very fast turnover rate. Faster. In other words, if you assist one farmer, and this farmer becomes a very good potato farmer, and is able to send all of their children to college, and the, uh, the children are lawyers and dentists and nurses. Then they go abroad. Who is left farming? The father who started it. And then this father will lease his land to a new farmer who knows nothing. And then you have to start teaching this farmer all over again. That is the scenario. You have a very fast turnover in the farmers. Our farmers, like all other countries in the world, are getting older. Young people don't want to go into farming. If your father is a farmer, you just say, Father is a farmer, but you are a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so they, there's, you know, there's little encouragement for food production. So the smallholder farmer is a is a, a breed of people that, that keeps changing its face. And so those who were assisted before um, will will move to because they become better, they have more money, they go to the, another place, they become retailers. We have a lot of you interview the retailers. Many of them used to be farmers. And because they begin to understand that the revenue is better in wholesaling and retailing, they, they transfer to these areas. And then they tell their cousins and aunts, kayo na lang mag farm. And then these guys catch up and they become retailers. <laughs> it goes on like that. So there is assistance. But um, I really have no answers as to how do you encourage children to become farmers. It's the same way how they encourage children to eat vegetables. <laughs> Right? Parenting. <laughs> the third question is about the orange. Ah, I think they might be from China. <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, usually oranges have very high uh, shelf life compared to leafy vegetables or carrots and even uh, red pepper or bell pepper. Oranges, have, they, have, they have their own skin. Same way as pomelo. The pomelos in Mindanao can last up to one month, two months, you know, to eat it. It'll be okay, it's not going to walk away. It'll be stay in the table. <laughs> so, oranges are the same, citrus and no shelf lives. I was just kidding about you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> more questions? We have time for two yes, more. Sir. The first one, the hand that I saw is over there. Yes, ma'am? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dorothy Del Carmen from the PHTRC. Uh, it has long been uh, recognized that uh, selling to supermarket is really profitable. But other than the legalistic requirement of the supermarket, I think uh, a major reason why uh, many small farmers <coughs> won't, wouldn't want to deal with them is the payment, uh, payment uh, scheme. So it's, it's very late. I think it goes up to three months before they get paid. So uh, how do you, I mean, it is in your project, or is it uh, the same case? Uh, okay. Thank you for your yeah. question. That's a good one. That question refers to another part of the same project where we, after we did this study, we tell our farmers this is the demand, and this is the way you should go. And so we group the farmers into clusters and teach them marketing and production techniques and teach them to negotiate, uh, to talk to the buyer. The problem, of course, are the uh, official receipts, the certifications of the, the legal identities and the payment fee. So we always choose a supermarket that's willing to be more development-oriented than profit-oriented. And we have found some, at least in Davao City, where they are paying the farmers 
um, if not the same day, the next day. So there's only a one day. And they what they do is they it, it's usually in check, right? So they they get to check, they encash it for the farmers, the farmer waits and the farmer gets cash. So the farmer is very happy. The farmer goes home to Malayo Lugar, which is usually you know very bumpy night with the cash and then distributes the cash to all the other poor farmers. There is, we, we train one of them to become the, what we call a market facilitator. And he's the one who does the talking, does the negotiating, and also distributes the cash. So that has been avoided so far. The first experience that we did like five years ago, that was the mistake. Uh, we did not talk to the supermarket to about the payment terms. We were not very clear about that. We were still feeding our way. So this one I think is a little bit better. Still lots of ground for improvement, but it's better now. Farmers seem to be smiling more. So I think that's a good thing. Last question for today. Yes, sir. Sorry, first time. Yes, uh, I noticed that in your presentation you said you fear taking pictures of the supermarket. And I was wondering why or perhaps. I never took a picture of a vegetable trader in the, you know, uh, what they call this, the Tom police. Tom. Uh, has that disappeared? Or were you just to scale? Uh, anyway, uh, that's just, okay. that's just for you. But, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to relate to the question of the person from Indonesia. And I was asking, in fact, if the Philippines or, you know, if there is ever a, a technology already developed uh, to extend the shelf life of vegetables. I think that is one of these questions. And, uh, uh, I think in some countries there are, even in Taiwan, but in the Philippines it is beginning. Uh, one of the things in extending uh, the shell life of the vegetables is to use some kind of uh, intervention where you have to use some kind of chemical uh, that arrest, you know, uh, aging or something, or it's not down the aging process. And in fact, some countries would call it as a substitute for refrigeration because from the point of production, once this vegetables produced are subjected to this kind of treatment, you can fully export them you know, or over the uh, uh, for a certain length of time, maybe even one week or two weeks improve. And uh, perhaps I would like to ask my own observation of why uh, Filipinos eat less vegetables. I would know that because I'm a Visayan. Uh, you can't eat vegetables without mixing it with, uh, you know, fish. But uh, I asked one question to a uh, foreign student in time about eating habit. You know, he said, "Oh, we eat just like you." Uh, he happens to be Buddhist. We eat like you, like Christians, we eat everything. And uh, maybe this has some relation, you know. Uh, let's say if you are a Muslim brother, that would mean other food, food, vegetables plus other food, less uh, pork. And if you are a Hindu, it means vegetables plus other food, less beef. Perhaps it is this kind of, you know, in Yuwada, here we are, we eat everything. <coughs> so, let's just move on. Thank you for your comment. Okay, so I guess, um, okay, let's have another Ramesha's question, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Mark, for that very interesting discussion. But in one of the uh, programs, uh, four to five, in the morning of DGWD uh, by Francis Cancino, I heard that uh, 
There's a technology now that the banana fruit is peeled and then frozen, and then this will prolong the shelf life. So, could this be applied to other uh, vegetables, fruits, instead of using formalin? <laughs> for money for people, for, not for vegetables, because it is possible that you eat formalin uh, treated uh, vegetable. The next morning you are already dead. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of interest uh, on the work of, um, you know, possible work on prolonging the shelf life of vegetables, but I think we need to defer that to the post harvest research and training sector. Um, we are really a school of management. We just manage the money. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for everyone. I think we can just uh, approach Dr. Concepcion after the presentation for more questions.